Quiet. We want to start and we need to be quiet because the microphone is having some issues. And I, I have a quiet voice, but I'll try my best to articulate and to project. Project, correct. I'll try my best to project. Um, um, well, we could come, well, we can squeeze in. Yep. If you don't mind moving a little bit, and then you can hear my voice. Uh, I'd like to finish our lecture. I, I'm sad to know that it's our last lecture. Maybe you're relieved. But um, I, I, one first thing I want to say is that Dr. Hirschfeld is up and moving, and she's uh, doing ra rather well. And she's incredible, I must say that. Uh, I'd like to go through very quickly. We uh, have already discussed the foundational uh, principles of and experiences of Chinese history. And I want to just maybe go into one brief period and then go into the Qing period. But I want to talk a little bit about the Ming. Everyone knows about the Ming dynasty. Ming vases, <laughs> Ming everything. Around. Well, what I could say about the Ming uh, is that what we see here in a nutshell is a consolidation of what is truly Chinese history. Now, one thing you have to remember and always keep in mind is cyclical change, dynastic change in Chinese history, the perception of dynastic change. We might have that here in the United States in terms of uh, um, our elector, uh, in terms of every two years, six years, four years, we have an electoral process. Uh, the Japanese don't have any such thing. The British don't have any such thing. They have their own way of dealing with politics, which isn't going rather, rather well right now. But the Chinese have a heritage and a history of change based on the idea of what is truly, what is what would be beneficial to the people. Now, what I've given to you, keep that in mind, what I've given to you, what I've distributed here is a simple essay, uh, which I, uh, my students read, uh, both here at Temple and Georgetown, and it's written by Shambao, but we'll get to that in a, a few minutes. Uh, the important thing is we have our map on the front, and uh, this is very important because I want to talk about, a little bit about Ming history and the consolidation of a Chinese identity and art, and it's very simple in that we have a period of uh, I don't have my mic, a period of stability and what's interesting is when we look at the period of the Ming dynasty the Ming we're looking at a period from 1368 1368 to 1644 and dates are always important 1368 1644 the Ming is coming out of the Song which is post-Tang dynasty. So we have the Tang, the Song, and the Ming, and the Qing. And that's about it for us. Okay, we'll keep it simple. 1368, what's happening in the world? The Song dynasty is so far superior in terms of technology, in terms of exploration, in terms of adventure even, that it's very, very sophisticated, very, in terms of, you look at the evidence, the archeological evidence, and the history, the historical memory is there. So when one goes to China, you will see this evidence. What's important, however, is the philosophical and cultural conviction and proof. That's going to always be there. Going from 1368 through the 1400s, 1500s, what happens in the 1500s? Yes. So and it, that's a very good point, because you see, the Chinese didn't have a renaissance. They already did it. <laughs> they didn't have to re be reborn, or re to recreate or renovate their culture. That's a very good point. That's very well put. The Europeans are going through a renaissance. And 
that's a difficult topic, but a beautiful topic. And so what we see as China begins to go down, according to the Chinese mentality, cyclical change, down, up, and down, and then new dynasties emerge as a result. When we get into the 1500s, we see trouble happening in China, uh, but we see something happening in Europe. Beginning in four, 1400s, rather than the Renaissance. The Renaissance, you know, is happening. So 1498, what happens? We've got now the idea of, the Europeans have this idea of exploring the world. The creation of, uh, uh, of an academy for navigation earlier, even 1496, you know, the Treaty of Tordesillas. Can you imagine the Treaty of Tordesillas? You know what the Treaty of Tordesillas is? The Treaty of Tordesillas is a simple thing, but an everlasting impact. You have these explorers, the emperors, the people in power coming over to Rome and asking the Pope what to do. So the Pope goes to his office and he has, he has a globe. He turns it around, okay, all right, we'll split the world in two. All right, Portugal, this is for you. Spain, this is for you. There are a few anomalies to that. In other words, Portugal can go east, Spain will go west, with the exception of what is Brazil. <laughs> That's the one anomaly. However, it doesn't stop there, though. We've got now conviction on the part of the Europeans. This is the thing to do to explore the world. Now, what, are the, what, are the, what is the rationale to go out hither, thither? They've got the navigational skills. Prince Henry, Henry II set up an academy early on in, in the 15th century to educate young men to learn cartography, map making, to learn the skills of, of navigation. What are you going to do with that, those skills? What are you going to do with those skills? You're going to use them well. We have now what I would consider the first stage of imperialism, the first stage of, of European imperialism. Now, did the Chinese ever conquer? Yes, they did. And I, want, I wanted to say this last uh, class in the sense that the Tang Dynasty, going back to the 8th century especially, between the 7th and 8th century, the Chinese were conquerors by force. And that's how the dynasty was even established, by force. By violent force. Force used against others and force used against within <coughs> the power elite. Okay, now we're into, of course, the 15th century and 16th century. And this is a very good idea to remember the Ming in terms of we have now security. The new Ming dynasty has established itself and we have a succession of tremendously good emperors up to a point, maybe three generations, maybe four if we're lucky. But the point is the cultural power and you know Professor Nye up at Harvard he talks about soft Power. You know the concept of soft power? We're going to talk about it today. Do you know what that is, soft power? The idea that culture can be a convincing uh, rather than military force. However, it's actually quite, I'm thinking about this since last week, I'm thinking how dangerous it can be. When one begins to think of themselves as superior to the other, and one's culture is better than the other, so this idea of soft power isn't convincing to me. I'm sorry, Professor Nye, I'm <laughs> there at Harvard, but I, uh, you know, I love Harvard and all of that. But be that as it may, but think about that. Because culture seems to always come through. Power uses culture. In the purest sense, culture will prevail, in the purest sense. And then we see that in the Ming Dynasty. We see the establishment and the recognition of what is Chinese. 
and that will prevail. It comes through in literature, it comes through in art, it comes through in social organization, and even politics in the educational, educational system. Now, we go into 1688, we have a demise of the Ming, and it's overthrown, as is often the case in Chinese history, because of corrupt behavior, corrupt government, and so on and so forth. And a new revolution, a Manchu, a foreign company, oh, com uh, a company of men, I was gonna say company of warriors come in, and they are not Chinese. And now we're talking about 1688, 1690, somewhere in there. We have the establishment of the Qing, the Qing dynasty. This is the last of the imperial dynasties to, well, no, is it? The Qing come in. Who are they? They are Manchus. They are from the north. They're not Han Chinese. And they establish a very interesting government. They have government segregated according to Manchu and Han Chinese. And so you have a dual kind of cultural situation going on. Okay, so we're looking at from 16, late 1600s to 1911. That's where we are now. But in between, let me just briefly tell you what's happening, because I only have, we only have a few minutes, unfortunately. But let's go on. We have three wonderful emperors again who come in. They become Chinese. They eventually become acculturated. I had students or people even say, what is acculturate? You don't acculturate. Do we acculturate or do we not? Ought yeah. we, ought we acculturate? I think we should. If I go to China, I have to speak Chinese. If I go to Japan, I have to speak Japanese, but I won't succeed. And when you do that with the United States political situation, it's a very volatile situation. Just keep that in mind. Throw it up in the air. If you're a teacher, we're all giving. Teachers are giving and loving, and uh, well, I hope, <laughs> but, um, and probably more strict than I am. But keep that in mind. When you go to China, you have to know Chinese. You go to Japan or Korea, you have to know. In order, and what I'm saying, not to travel, but to actually acculturate yourself. To, will I always be a white guy in China? Yes. Does it really matter that much to the Chinese? And that's, we're we'll bringing that up because I have a student, uh, an issue, uh, not an issue, uh, a very wonderful example with one of my students. Uh, he's, I read through him, he's such a great guy, but he's only, what, 19 or 20? But he's so occult, uh, mm, uh, indoctrinated, if I can use that word, with Maoism. And that's what really is happening in China. So let, let me go back a little bit, okay? And there is a reason for that. So we're looking at the, here at the Ming, and we have great leadership. We see the acculturation of these Manchus, the Manchus. These are not Han Chinese. These are people coming in from the north. You have your maps there. The north, the northeast. Coming in, boom, taking advantage, of course, of the weakness and the downfall of the Ming. So, we'll move along. Now, this is what's fascinating. When we're looking at the peak of Chinese history, there are many peaks in Chinese history. Contempt, I call, really, in terms of what is modernity? What is modern mean? Well, when I look at, say, China, I look back at the Song Dynasty, which is right just before looking at the 1300s and the Middle Ages. It's kind of parallel to the Middle Ages. But the Chinese had engineering, 
um, successes and all of those wonderful things, trade and all of those wonderful things. Something then went down. Then we have the Ming coming in. However, what we have during this period from, 16, from 1688 to uh, the, its collapse, we have um, I guess political and cultural uh, control and everything is organized. Now let's do this. When we look at say uh, the 1600s uh, in Europe, what's going on? We have the beginnings of political change, industrial change, cultural change. But more importantly, we see in Europe what's happening is because of what we were going back to what we were saying earlier is that the idea of conquering the world, or is it conquering the world, or going around the world to know the world. Now, I want your opinion on this. I'm thinking too. When we look at the 16th century, and we look at the stability of China, the instability of Japan, and of course Korea is part of China in some way. South, we're not going to go into Southeast Asia right now. We, can't, we don't have time for that. So let's look then at the 16th century, Europe. And let's try to see the influence that the 16th century Europe had on China. Have you thought about that? It's very interesting. What would be the number one influence would be navigation, trade. The whole purpose, of course, for the Europeans was to have a direct access to the materials, the re natural resources that Asia provided. King Henry VIII once said, you know, I get my, can you help me? King Henry, as he got older, got a little bigger. <laughs> and because of his leg and all of that, yes. Are you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. And so uh, there was this uh, idea that Asia would be the direct route to, a uh, direct route to uh, obtaining access to these natural resources, such as pepper, spices and so on and so forth. You learned that in high school, grade school. Nothing new there. But the question is now, how did they do it and who were involved? Initially were the Portuguese. The Portuguese because of Henry II, Prince Henry, and the navigational um, techniques that his students learned were venturing out. And their idea was to get direct access to those spices. Well, that's all fine and dandy. The Portuguese really did not have a desire. Now, please challenge me because I, I actually don't believe this myself. I think they did <laughs> have um, a desire for territorial acquisition. But it was limited. And I think the Portuguese leadership, because of, in 15, was it? 1598, we have the combination of the Portuguese crown with the Spanish crown. So things combine. So now we have Spain taking over. Initially, the Portuguese were going out, though. And they were going around the globe and over to Asia. India. India. Remember that. If you ever have a course, I think Dr. Hirschfeld taught a course on India. The Portuguese were there first. And in terms of Westerners. And then, now they're going over to China. And then eventually to Japan. By 1549, they're already in Japan. And the goal is for, the, the, we have Portuguese and Spanish at that time, going from <coughs> Japan into China. China was the center of the world. Well, what's interesting is, the Chinese were able to contain, this is a very important issue, they were able to contain the influence and the domination of the European powers. In other words, they were on equal parity in terms of military parity 
intellectual parity, there were probably, there were, yeah, there was a parity. Military parity, economic parity. So they could contain these intruders. This is what's fascinating about the Ming Dynasty. And they were able to control this balance of power between Asia and Europe. Well, that's all great. Now things begin to change in Europe. And when you look at China, you cannot ignore the rest of the world. What created the collapse of the Ming Dynasty, we don't need to worry too much about in, in the sense that it's a typical process of corruption and decay and relative uh, disorganization. But it also coincides with what's happening in Europe. What do we have happening in Europe in the 1600s and 1700s? 1600s, what do we have? We're talking about a scientific revolution. The what? Exploration. Oh, exploration, and now we have a scientific, a belief in science, a belief in the truth of science. And this is very convincing. And we see this happening in Europe. We see it happening in France, throughout England, throughout Europe. Germany doesn't exist, so I mean, we're not going to get there yet. We're going to get there soon, but not, not in this discussion. But we have basically a scientific revolution. We've got proof. One and one equals three. No, no. One and one equals two. But look at the research that's taking place in terms of dynamics. Yes? It seems to me in the back of my brain that there was a eunuch admiral named Zheng He, Zheng He. who had a huge navy. Zheng He. Yeah. The Chinese navy that, that protected the merchant shipping from China to the east coast of Africa, even. Yes. And the Chinese decided to Cut decimate that, that navy. And kill Did him. that play any role in this? It did. This is the downfall of the Ming. This has become, become very insular, very defend, very insular. So this is creating to the collapse of the Why United States. Why did they decimate the Roman Navy? We're talking about internal problems. The best way to control our problems is to focus on our internal problems and get this Zhang He, Zhang He, get him back home and then we'll kill him. And they did that. Now, the Chinese, interestingly enough, were not the only ones to do that. The Vietnamese, what we call Vietnam, they were the first ones to do that. Mm -hmm. How many people have been able to conquer Vietnam? Nobody. Mm -hmm. Remember that. And I, you know, we can even, the course of Vietnam history is a little too close to home, perhaps for some, not for me, I wouldn't, but it's a very powerful story. Now we have Afghanistan, we have the Middle East, we, things that have to be dealt. We can talk about that in a few minutes. Bring that up. But Zhang He is the one. He was the great, this is the epitome of Ming, the epitome of China going out around to wor the world to discover. Boy, they brought him home and then bloop, that's it. Everything was shut down. Everything was shut down. He was a threat to the political, internal, internal uh, correct, of correct, correct. That's correct. <laughs> so, now, we have the Europeans coming in at the same time, a little bit later, but at, in, within succession. So we're looking at the 1600s of China, 1600s in China. We have the Europeans coming in. What do they want? They want trade. There's no concept of, of diplomacy. There's no concept yet of diplomacy. That will come in about two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what happens with China is, is, is really quite remarkable. It, it gives us an idea of, in 1600s, China. We're looking at now how these Europeans are coming in. We have the Dutch, we have the British, predominantly. Trade has always existed in China. Trade has always existed with China. 
always. Would it be on an equal basis? At that time, it was controlled by China. And that's fair. At that time, it was, why? What did China have to receive? China has everything at that time. They have everything. As I said the other day, it doesn't need Woolies from England, okay? No. Okay, a little preview of what's to come. But 1600, the, the British are coming in after India. They're coming in in search of, of a position. A new global order is being established by the 1600s. This is going to lead to the collapse of the Ming and allow the northern invasion by the Qing. You can, I wish I had a blackboard or a whiteboard, whatever you call them. Uh, it's Q I N G. Okay? All right. So now we have the Europeans, they're going now. They're going. They're moving. They've got their technology because it's scientific revolution. And then we get into the 1700s. Now, the Qing, by the way, is okay. The Vietnamese are okay. I'm not talking about anyone else in Asia. I'm not leaving that for later. But they have an idea of security. They're on a parity, as I said. Military, political, everything is equal. Okay? But what's interesting is the Qing and the Ming and the Qing will put these Europeans in a position. They're only allowed to dock there and that spot and that's it and we will control it we will contain you you are not allowed to go here or anywhere else and we will control your trade and your whatever you have to give us fair enough from that point of view at that time right so well, they in other words the Europeans were not even able to attack China or Asia Time. They couldn't. Admiral Nelson, of course, where good old Admiral Nelson and Lady Hamilton and all those stories. No, it wasn't enough. Even Napoleon couldn't get that far. <laughs> we know that story. All right, so let's move a little bit down into the middle of the 1600s. Guess who shows up? Missionaries start. Jesuits start. And it's not a bad story, because if you understand the nature of the Jesuits, they have a different way of approaching. And I'm not going to go into the whole story, but they were already there. There's one name I want you to even look up. It's Matteo, M-A-T-E-O, R-I, the most important name, R-I-C-C-I, -C -C -I. Ricci. Ricci. This one. And then, and the Jesuits in, as a whole, they're very strict. And they were founded in 1540. And by 1549, they were already in Japan. Okay? Very successful in terms of education and science and architecture. But in China, Matteo comes in Ricci comes in in the 1600s. He doesn't have an easy time, but his, he succeeds. And others come in, other Jesuits, I should say, other Jesuits come in to China. And they work with the system. They work with the imperial court. So that's why when you go to Beijing, when you go, if you haven't already, if you go back again or whatever, you will find his grave in the imperial graveyard. He's buried with the imperial court. Uh, yes, he's there. Because of what they introduced the Chinese to astronomy, architecture, art. And if you go to the art museum, it's very easy. If you go down up on the second floor, well, you can go, it depends on where they move them and send them. <laughs> Just upstairs and then go that way, make a left, go then down. You will find beautiful paintings that are Chinese paintings, but using Renaissance style that was introduced by the Jesuits. So the Jesuits have four, they take four vows. 
One, of course, are the basic vows, which are not always held. I won't go into that. And the idea, though, is the other one is to teach or to pursue medicine, architecture, astrology, whatever the science is, okay? So they're good teachers. Do that as a may. Sometimes too smart is not good. Anyway, this is a balance of power. The Chinese can control them. All right, what happens? This is a question that Dr. Reichauer up at Harvard asked. What went wrong? And that's another issue, but the idea still is what went wrong? Well, it's not what went wrong. It's an idea here that the Europeans are getting more power after the defeat, particularly of Napoleon. The British now are becoming imperial powers, a power, the imperial power right up until about 1902, up and just before World War I, and that destroyed them, you know that. So the question then is, how does China then respond to this? The parity had been there, now we see the power of the Europeans through the British getting stronger and stronger through naval power and military power through technology, which is part of the 18th century industrial revolution. So we had the scientific revolution. Now we have now a very interesting development, the technological industrial revolution. The use of science to, to power. This is very, very interesting because it's going on to this very day. By the 1800s, that balance, the parity is gone, the balance is like this, okay? There's no balance at all. So, the British are coming along, and why are they coming along? What do they want? Well, they want domination of the sea. And there are theories. Alfred Thayer, he comes in the late 1800s, he comes along, and we have the idea here that now the British are coming and, well, let's use our power and simply uh, use it. Trade is the issue. Trade is the reason now the British government is going, British people are going to use the military to secure trade advantage. We talk about comparative advantage. We talk about advantage in trade and business and so on and so forth. And for a long time, we didn't talk about ethics in medicine or in business or in law. We still need to talk about that. However, the British are basically trying to get an advantage. They have nothing really that will meet the demand. In other words, they cannot sell to the Chinese what the British people want in terms of exchange or trade. Well, obviously, by already in the 1500s, the British had already, English, British English, had been in India. Through marriage, there were claims already. And then the Mughal dynasty had given the English power over their territories to help them. So they eventually became enmeshed in the dynamics of Indian politics, which is incredibly complicated. So they have now, the English have access to a product that the Chinese might want, and that you all know that, which is opium. Now, the thing about the opium wars, and this is what I, I, I watch our time here, is that by the 1820s, 1830s, the British, the English, have no competitive edge, no competitive advantage over the Chinese. So they begin distributing, it's called a triangular trade. Triangular trade. So we've got England, India, China. This is how it's gonna work to the advantage of the English. Now I'm not anti-British by any means. But this is the truth. There is a company called Jardine, Jardine Matheson. Do you know that? Jardine Matheson. It's a very important company. Keep that in mind. Jardine Matheson. It's still functioning. Pardon me? 
Jardine Matheson. Look it up. Yeah, it's a very good, very interesting trading company. It began at this time in terms of trade. So the British now, the English, will pretty much bring, I can say British, I guess it's fair enough, at this point, in creating contacts with middlemen in China, in what we call Canton or Guangzhou. South, you have your map there in Guangzhou, which here is Beijing, and then down here is near Hong Kong. Okay? Hong Kong didn't really exist. Hong Kong was a vacant, a rocky island. Now, the idea here is how do we create a market? How do we create a market that we can win? We, we, we can be competitive at competing and competing with uh, other traders. They're also coming in. Of course, they have access now to what we now, Northwest, Northwest India, which is now Afghanistan. They have poppy seeds and then they've figured out this is opium from the little part of the flower of the poppy. And they would basically pack it into little little pockets like that, I guess, maybe bigger than that, and then put them into a crate about that size. Ship them over and then have the Chinese middlemen, the Chinese merchants, create a market of distribution. And they would never, the British would never, or Jardy Mathis would never, oh, I didn't do it. That, that, they are doing it. You know, we're just supplying what they want. Right? <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not fully aware of the opium, opioid crisis that we have here. Apparently it's maybe something similar. I'm not aware of it. I have to learn more about that. <coughs> but anyway, I'm too busy to, I have to, Prices must be apparent. You much you know much more about that. But anyway, they're creating these packets, packets of opium and giving them over to the Chinese. And the Chinese is creating their the Chinese are creating their own market. The Chinese are actually creating their own sellers and buyers. And the the, the, the suppliers are whoa, that's nothing to do with us. Okay. Come around 1838. 39, 1838, 39, in the Qing dynasty, okay? The imperial government up in Beijing is saying, hey, what's going on here? This is just not right. You're creating a, an addicted, mar a market of dependency. And so they send one of their best men, one of their best diplomats, so to speak, down to the source of the problem. He tries everything. This guy tries everything. He puts in these rails under, you know, link chains under the ocean so that prevent the <laughs> boats coming in. Not with an English boat at that time. No, they just ran right through it. it. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. So what happens is this wonderful guy from Beijing says, "All right, this is what I'm going to do." You have to, we're going to take, take it in. He takes control of all the supply, the warehouses, and he basically creates these lanes that he has people dig up these canals. He dumps all of the opium in there, puts salt in there, and flushes that out into the ocean. Oh, the English now get upset. That's private property. That's private property. How dare you? Okay, what's the point of this whole suit? We have now the beginning of the Opium Wars from 1839 to 1842. Well, obviously, the Chinese are defeated because of the military power of, of the Europeans, the British. But what's more important for us to understand is the fact that what was imposed by the British on the Chinese was the beginning of the end of Chinese sovereignty. And what do I mean by that? There was an imposition of what we call the so-called Treaty of Nanking. Nanjing, I'm sorry, Nanjing. And what does that mean? It means there are five things that, I wish I had my board to write, uh, my PowerPoint, but it doesn't matter. One is 
extraterritoriality. This is just five points of many, many points in this treaties that are imposed upon the Chinese in 1842. First, extraterritoriality. What does that mean? In other words, if you're in China and you get into a, a barroom brawl, right? And you, you, you kill a Chinese person. Okay, so that happens. You will not be prosecuted or even investigated by the Chinese government. No, at all. It has to be only by your peers, that's it. So their law is not, in other words, your law, your people, is denying the law of the Chinese. Now how did that begin? Go back to 1824 with the case of Terranova. Terranova, this is an American situation, Terranova, was an American sailor on a boat, and apparently he it was an accident. Maybe dropped over a, a pot or something, and it killed. You know, if you go into Hong Kong, the waters are not very deep, so you'd have to have little boats come out. And so, this pot that fell over supposedly killed this woman. For, it was it was providing fruit and juice and water and things like that, and killed the poor woman. And so the Americans thought, okay, we'll, we'll go to court and we'll figure it out. Ah, the guy was killed, boom. That triggered the whole idea now. These Chinese are not civilized. According to international law, according to European standards of law. Oh, that's another great topic. You get my point though. All right, so by 1842, we have the imposition based on that premise that precedent, we have now a whole new standard of law being imposed and being used and being recognized according to the standard of international law, which is just beginning to be developed according to imperialism. It'll go to an, like one, one in hand, okay? Extraterritoriality means that you are immune. It's not the same as diplomatic immunity, but we could look at it that way. In other words, you can only be judged by your peers, not the Chinese. And what the impact, that's number one. Number two, the British now have control over tariffs, over trade. Number three, the British have, uh, and the British have control over trade and things like that. The British now have control over who can res reside in your country. Number four, we have missionaries. And number five, we want ports. We want more, more ports. So translate all of that, it means that the Chinese have lost sovereignty. They lost sovereignty over law. They lost sovereignty over, over, over their, in terms of their trade. They lost sovereignty in terms of control in legal matters. They've lost control. It's been taken over. Do you understand that? The nature of what we call the unequal treaty port system is now being imposed upon all of Asia, all of Asia, with the exception India has its own issues, okay? But looking at China, Japan, that's it. So please understand, with this imposition of the unequal treaty port system through the Treaty of Nanjing, we've got a problem. In other words, the Chinese don't have sovereignty anymore. And this creates a crisis that lasts from 18, can you imagine, from 1843 to 1949. The Chinese don't have any control of themselves. The Europeans have control. And the reason I'm saying that is, if you read anything about contemporary, present day perceptions of Chinese leadership, it will reflect this experience. It's very true. Is, is that clear? I've tried to kind of rush through all of that. Now let's look at our, our little handout here. And this is something that, uh, this is by Professor Sanders from uh, MIT and from uh, elsewhere. 
He doesn't really, he's just, just brilliant. So, what I want to highlight is to take a look at the map. You've been studying, I can see that you've been studying your map. Maybe not very clear for you. But you can also see the, the geography, how this is what's so lovely about this map. You can see the geography in the map. And that's very important. Now, when we look at the very, in, very, this is how he begins. After decades of exerting only modest regional influence, China now plays an active and important role in Asia. Very humble to say, it's obvious. Now, we call it the China threat. Is China a threat? What happened yesterday, at this uh, Saturday, at this meeting with, uh, in Argentina? It, it, we have, no, nothing's done with even Mexico has a new president. Trudeau is not pro-Trump. Uh, we have a lot to work with, and it's you and us that have to be involved. But look at China here. In terms of the concessions that have been made, in terms of the concessions that I made in terms of President Xi um, the other day, in terms of opening markets, we've been through this since the 1980s. President Bush has been through this. Oranges, can you imagine arguing with Japanese over oranges and Chinese over oranges? No. How many of us drive cars that are not American? You know? Well, let's just highlight some of the very important points. What is China's Asia strategy? What is China's, Asia, is to dominate? Without a doubt. There's no doubt. Please, don't be deceived. He continued, I, didn't, I just said that. China's regional strategy derives in part from a global grand strategy. Yes, when you have to write, you have to write like that. <laughs> the domestic top concern of Chinese leaders is maintaining political stability and ensuring the continued rule, continued rule, of the CCP, Chinese Communist Party. Well, we know that. We know that the president of China now, Xi Jinping, we know she is a president for life. And I told you that it has its limitations. Oh, come on, we're not gonna come up, I'm a realist, okay? You're president for life, how are you gonna do that? How do you undo it, right? This is terrible. It reminds me of something. It reminds me of something. And then, keep that in mind, the grand strategy defines the international and domestic context in which China formulates and pursues its Asia policy. Asia is the most important region of the world to China in economic, security, and political terms. That's a key point. Economic, <laughs> now where is the role of the United States in all of this? In terms of trade, how much of, I have a, well she died already unfortunately because her son was a doctor and he went out to save people, now it's another story. Very young guy, he's, you know. Anyway, um, she would tell me, she, she was Chinese, um, her name is Emily Liu, you may have met her Emily, maybe not, but anyway, don't buy Chinese, no, no, she's Chinese. No, no Chinese, no. <laughs> Economic policy, trade, again. Now, the idea here is the historical memory of the tree port system, the historical memory of that 100 year of oppression that was imposed upon the Chinese. Oh yes, it's a, everything's a two way, three way, four way way. But the Chinese were humiliated for more than 100 years, going from the grandeur of the Ming, the grandeur of the early Qing, to the demise and the collapse of imperial rule by 1911. And to be overtaken, now by 1949, we have the success of the Communist Party, as you well know, and uh, we don't have time for that, but just keep these, we're talking about China now. This is in their historical memory and their minds. And then we talk about, you can, what about political power? They, what do you think about political power? Is there a balance of power in China, no. in Asia? No. And who wants to create that balance? Why isn't there? Why, why? Why is there no balance of power? 
there's no economic. What about political power? What about military? Those are the three concerns. Economic, military, I'm gonna add a fourth, cultural. And there it goes back again, the question. The influence of culture. Salt culture? Mm, we'll see, no. It's always backed up by, I'm not a cynic, but I'm a realist, by military and economic strength. Carry on, please. Well, they, they have a, a design, uh, they have a plan, and, oh, yes. uh, and that's it, and they don't, and, and they don't want to have anyone criticizing that. Correct. Ah, oh, correct. I, I have to agree with you, um, in the sense that, well, we see this deal going on down in Argentina. Oh, yes, we'll buy a few more your oranges, but we'll still export. There will still be a trade imbalance. The nature of the trade imbalance has to be also thought out, which it is. So we have that idea of economic power. And we have statistics as you read your notes. I'm not gonna, the military power. Now that's my major concern, is the military threat that Chinese will pose. Now why do I consider that a, mil a concern? The economic power I think the United States can, ma can manage if we put our mind and our noses to the grindstone and stop being, oh, give me, give me, give me, all this nonsense, right? And that's what Emily was trying to say. Why do you need these things that are not really well made? They're just things that you can throw out in a day or a month or a year or whatever. Suppose it's like an Ikea of, of clothing or whatever you have. Even our tools, our military, and our military, are, you know, tools. Everything is made in China. When everything was made in Philadelphia on, at one point. Mm -hmm. So military power is my concern. Now, that leads me into intelligence, in terms of military intelligence, which is really very important. And technology, in terms of how much information. Why are we always on the verge of aggression? Why are we there? Why can't we just learn how to cooperate? What is the nature of, of a president's position in France, in England, in Germany, the United States or Canada? Japan. Japan is with the Europeans. Japan is not considered Asian. Japan is with us. Maybe I'm communist, I don't know. Where's Putin in all of this? Hmm. Okay? So now we've got the idea we've already mentioned about soft power. Soft power is simply the idea of using, of inviting students and using cultural means to get access. What, I guess when I, it must have been a couple of years ago already, not that long ago, we had a professor from Penn become provost of Temple, and all of a sudden, things went awry, went, went very strange. That professor was Chinese, not Chinese American, Chinese. He was a spy. He was fired, as well as the president. China's reassurance policies. China's reassurance. Well, China is, is, how does China try to reassure people? Through money and power and influence. Is it imitating the power of the United States? Is it following the example of what the United States has been doing? Or is it simply carrying on with its own tradition? Do you think that China today is, still thinks through its leadership that it is a tribute state? In other words, people have to bring uh, uh, tributaries, bring back their dignity. So keep that in mind, because history is very much part of our, our heritage. So relations with Asia and China uh, are very much upon, dependent upon that historical component, the balance of memory and real, real power. 
Now, what, now, just to finalize, the balancing act that China is trying to create. It can only have any influence with the United States, not with Europe, not with Japan, but only with the United States. Why? Because of our economic dependency, mutual <coughs> dependency, in terms of the market. The market just went up, what, 500 points? I don't know when I came in, 500 points, right? Today. Today, yeah. yes because of what happened with Trump and, and Don and Argentina. Yes. So we last see this question. mutual. Yes, last question. Sorry to be a. No, I know. Time, time. Now, my, my last question, or please ask, but please take this home and uh, just give it a through. And all, always watch your news. It doesn't matter what kind of source you have. Just keep aware of what's going on in China and Asia in general. Because without Asia, the United States will not be happy, put it that way. We can survive, but we won't be happy. We're, we're already at this point. That's a beautiful way to end the class because Asia now, we're, we're together now. I want to thank you so much for your patience more than anything else.